Hello YouTube! Our story today is about a family tragedy. So let's get started. Benaz Mahmoud was born on December 16, 1958 in northern Iraq. Her parents, Mahmoud Babakir Mahmoud and Beya, were involved in an arranged marriage. They had a son and five daughters. The Mahmouds were a strictly traditional Iraqi Kurdish family. The Mahmoud family fled to the UK when Banas was 10 years old to escape the reign of Saddam Hussein. The family settled in Micham and fortunately for them, many members of their community also settled there. In the family, women are bound by very strict rules. They are not allowed to wear perfume, for example, or have long fingernails. And to keep them in line, they are married off as quickly as possible, usually to older men. The start of the drama Bikal, Benazi's elder sister, had an arranged marriage. She didn't like her husband because he mistreated her, even raped her. Pekal fled the family home in 2002 and spent time in foster care. She said that attempts had been made on her life and that her father had threatened to kill her mother, her sisters and himself if she did not return to the family home. Instead of returning home, Pekka lived in hiding, constantly on the move and never leaving the house without wearing a full veil. Mahmoud Babakir Mahmoud's inability to control Bekal was perceived as a weakness within the Kurdish community, which earned him a certain amount of ostracism. The Horrific Life of Banaz At the age of 17, Banaz was forced to marry a resident of Kaladiza, the family's hometown. She doesn't like her husband at all. He's not her style, but she doesn't object because she knows what will happen if she does. Her husband has taken her to live 200 kilometers away. This man has the same mentality as Babakir. He doesn't accept that Banaz doesn't do what he asks and he sometimes hits her so hard that she loses her memory. For her part, Banas takes note of everything that happens and photographs the marks of the blows she suffers so as to have evidence to show the police. He was getting worse and worse. Some of the times that he had beat me up or he was abusive towards me, I had to write it down in a diary. I have taken some pictures um, of my body, like, because he had kicked me so much, like, in the head. My lips were bleeding, my ears were bleeding. Um, when he kicked my head in, that really affected me. Like, now I've got a loss of memory, I can't remember things. She was in contact with the police throughout her marriage, claiming that she had been raped and beaten on multiple occasions. Her family were aware of the violence inflicted on her, but told her that leaving her husband would shame them. Despite this, and as the violence continued, she finally left after two years of marriage. She returned to the family home in July 2005 and began a relationship with someone of her choice, Ramat Soleimani. Benazi's uncle, Arya Gamamad, and her father both disapproved of her actions and had been informed that Banaz and Ramat had remained a couple despite their claims to the contrary. The whole community kept an eye on them and reported everything they saw to their families. On December 2, 2005, a meeting was held at Ari Agamamot's home, during which it was agreed that both of them should be killed for bringing opprobrium on the family and the community. Fearing for her safety, Banaz went to the police to report that 
her uncle had threatened to kill her and her boyfriend, having apparently learned of the plot after overhearing a phone call between her uncle and her mother on December 2nd. On December 12th, she handed in a letter to Wimbledon Police Station naming the people she believed were out to kill her. On the evening of December 31st, her father calls to discuss her divorce. He even forces her to drink alcohol. She says that something was wrong, and when her father left the room, she snapped, jumped out the window and fled toward town. She collapsed after minutes of running. She was then taken to hospital. This is a video caught by Ramad at the hospital. Uh, Unfortunately, when questioned by the police, they don't believe her at all. After this incident, Banaz went to live with Ramat. The couple was very afraid that someone would discover where they were hiding because they would be killed immediately and no one would find their bodies. The disappearance After a few weeks, Benazi's parents convinced her to come home. And on January 23, 2006, Bana sent Ramat a message saying, I love you. It was the last message she ever sent. On January 25th, 2006, Ramat reported her disappearance to the police. At first, the police didn't take the report seriously. Her parents presented themselves as an easygoing, tolerant family claiming that Banaz often spent the night out and insisting that she was not a missing person. Ramat persisted, however, pestering the police to take action. The investigation was taken over by the Metropolitan Police Homicide and Serious Crime Command and led by Detective Chief Inspector Carlin Good. Based on the assumption that Banaz was alive and been held against her will, a search and arrest operation was carried out. Simultaneous searches were carried out at properties across the country, but no sign of Banaz was detected. Her phone had not been activated since late on January 23 and her bank account had not been touched. The police have noticed that Banaz's family doesn't seem all that affected by the disappearance of one of their members. The police follow the movements of Banaz's three cousins and realize that these three men are not so innocent. One of Banaz's cousins had rented a car a few days before. One of the places passed by this car is an abandoned house in the middle of nowhere, on April 28, 2006, Banaz's body was found buried in the garden of this old house. The murder On the morning of January 24, 2006, Banaz's parents left the family home to take their youngest daughter to school and run errands leaving Banaz asleep in the living room. Muhammad married Hama, Muhammad Saleh Ali and Omar Hussein arrived at the property shortly afterwards. They subjected Banaz to over two hours of rape and torture before strangling her with a ligature. The Funeral After claiming that the Bana service would take place at the Regent's Park Mosque. The family went to a mosque in Tutin, 
Police Inspector Carlin Good said they had deliberately lied to us to stop us attending. When we arrived, it was clear that no funeral had been planned. The family had moved in without any warning. They went in to pray, leaving their daughter's body on the side road. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that it was our presence alone that forced the family to organize a funeral. Banas was buried in the joint Merton and Sutton Cemetery in Morden. Her family did not mark her grave. On June 26, 2007, a memorial service was held for Banas at the Morden Assembly Hall, following which a granite headstone was placed on her grave. Her family did not attend either of these ceremonies. The purchase of the gravestone was organized by the Iranian and Kurdish Women's Rights Organization. Police officers and the senior prosecutor, Nazir Afzal, were among the contributors. The Punishment In June 2007, Ben Aziz's father and uncle were unanimously found guilty of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment, with minimum sentences of 20 and 23 years respectively. Muhammad Hama pleaded guilty to murder shortly after the trial began and was sentenced to life imprisonment, with a minimum sentence of 17 years. In November 2010, Muhammad Saleh Ali and Omar Hussain were convicted of murder and sentenced to a minimum of 22 and 21 years respectively. In December 2013, Dana Amin was convicted and sentenced to 8 years in prison for helping to dispose of Banaze's body. Amin challenged his conviction and sentence. The appeal was rejected in September 2014. Ramat, the boyfriend. After the Banas murder, Soleimani was placed under witness protection. Despite threats from family members in Iran, he testified in both murder trials, and the risks he took in doing so were recognized by both Judge Brian Barker and the police, referring to him as one of the two real heroes of the case. Police Inspector Carlin Good said, Without him, we wouldn't have been able to do what we did. Without him, we wouldn't even have known that Banaz had disappeared. He risked his life to stand up to his whole community and in doing so, abandoned everything and everyone he knew. Soleimani struggled to adapt to his new life and the isolating nature of witness protection and apparently never recovered from Benazir's murder, he took his own life in 2016. It's a sad story, and the problem is that it's more common than you'd think. And that's it. Today, we talked about the terrible life of Banaz Mahmud, killed by her own family. If you liked this story, don't forget to like, subscribe, and press the notification bell to hear about other interesting stories. Until next time!